Good morning. The Lord always has his remnant. <laughs> You're proof of that. <laughs> Family camp. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. <laughs> My Bible is upside down. I should turn it. Well, it's a joy to worship with you this morning in the study of God's Word together. And um, I'm glad to be here with you, and I'm glad you're here this morning. We do miss several in family camp, and uh, we pray for their, um, that the Word was taught well there. And I hope they recorded it. I'll look forward to listening, um, hopefully, um, to Dr. Allman. Uh, this morning, we'll be looking at Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah chapter 52. Uh, last month, when I filled in, we looked at Isaiah 40, a great chapter of comfort and strength for God's people. Um, it began with those words in repetition, comfort, O comfort my people. And the chapter ended with the strength that the Lord God gives to his people. And so beautifully written, Yet those who wait for the Lord will regain or will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. This is the comfort and strength given by the everlasting eternal God, the creator uh, of the ends of the earth. Isaiah 40 points us to the one who is sovereign over every atom of the universe it pointed us to the first advent of the servant of the Lord who would come to remove the iniquity of his people. It pointed us to the arm of the Lord. And we see that here in our text this morning as well in Isaiah 52. The arm of the Lord who will come. It's a picture of the Messiah. Um, and like a shepherd, he will attend his flocks. In his arm, he will gather them he will gather the lambs and carry them to his bosom. This is the source. He is the source of true comfort and strength for his people. It's fulfilled and fully realized uh, in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was realized at the cross, and it will be fully realized at, his, at the second advent. The prophet Isaiah points Israel to the one who would redeem his people, who would come and deliver them out of their bondage um, in points of time, fulfilled at the culmination of time when he brings his own to himself, that remnant that Larry spoke of um, uh, at the opening. We, we're appointed to look to Christ, um, who, will, who has come, who will come again. Uh, his people will be forever comforted and strengthened in him. This morning, we continue in Isaiah in chapter 40, 52. Uh, the, it begins again with repetition. Awake. The command, awake, awake. I'll read. Awake, awake. Clothe yourself in strength, O Zion. Clothe yourself in your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For the uncircumcised and the unclean will no longer come into you. Shake yourself from the dust. Rise up, O captive Jerusalem. Loose yourself from the chains around your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus says the Lord, you were sold for nothing, and you will be redeemed without money. For thus says the Lord God, my people went down at first into Egypt to reside there. Then the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Now, therefore, what do, we, what do I have, declares the Lord, seeing that my people have been taken away without cause? Again, the Lord declares, those who rule over them howl, and my name is continually blasphemed all day long. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, in that day, I am the one who is speaking. Here I am. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. 
Listen, your watchmen lift up their voices. They shout joyfully together, for they will see in their own eyes when the Lord restores Zion. Break forth, shout joyfully together, your waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm in the sight of all the nations that all the ends of the earth may see the salvation of our God. Depart, depart, go out from there, touching nothing unclean. Go out of the midst of her, purify yourself, you who carry the vessels of the Lord. But you will not go out in haste, nor will you go as fugitives, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted, just as many were astonished at you, my people. So his appearance was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what had not been told them, they will see. And what they had not heard, they will understand. This is the word of the Lord God Most High. May God bless his word um, in our presence this morning. Many have called the book of Isaiah the gospel of Isaiah, the gospel according to Isaiah. We reference Matthew, the gospel according to Matthew, or the gospel according to Luke. Mark, the gospel according to John, but in it we see the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, in its, its uniformity. Um, it is the truth, the good news that, that, it, that has come. We see that here um, in our text this morning. The prophet Isaiah uh, is often retur- referred to as the uh, Old Testament evangelist the one who brings good news to his people. And so he is. We see that for good reason in our chapter this morning. The first 35 chapters of Isaiah warns Israel of the judgment to come, calling, calling Israel to repentance. That's, that's the gospel. Uh, we are guilty, vile, um, dead in our trespasses and sins, and yet we are called Uh, warned of the coming wrath of God who will come uh, to all people um, in a a call to repentance. The warning is all throughout the scriptures. And then in the second, the next 29 chapters, Isaiah points Israel to the servant of the Lord and the good news of salvation and deliverance that he would bring to his people. The servant of the Lord that would come and redeem his people in his work, in his person. We see that so wonderfully pictured in this chapter. Um, If one were teaching chapter 52, it would likely be broken into two sermons. Um, uh, It would be split. There would likely be one sermon starting in chapter 51, verse 1, through chapter 52, verse 2, uh, verse 12. It's a call or command for Israel to awake to wake up, to awaken. And the text then flows into the great fourth servant song, the final messianic servant song, where we enter into the Holy of Holies in chapter, from chapters uh, 52, verse 13, continuing through chapters 53, verse 12. But here we come kind of in the middle of that, uh, uh, that first Uh, call to awake towards the end of that call the command uh, the command here is to come awake uh, again with repetition and emphasis chapter 51 verse 1 uh, the the command is listen to me verse 3 look listen look verse 4 pay attention to me O my people and give ear to me O my nation Verse 6, lift up your eyes. Verse 9, awake, awake. We see that repetition. Awake, 
awake. Put on, the, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. We'll see later the arm of the Lord is a reference to his servant, the anointed one of God, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, um, the servant of the Lord. In verse 17 of chapter 51, rouse yourself, rouse yourself, arise, O Jerusalem. And now here in chapter 52, verse 1, these words are repeated again, awake, awake. Clothe yourself in your strength, Zion. Clothe yourself in beautiful garments, Jerusalem, the holy city, for the uncircumcised and the unclean will no longer come into you. Shake yourself from the dust. Rise up, captive Israel. Release yourself from the chains around your neck, captive daughter of Israel. Isaiah here is layering points of time in history, intertwining them together. Um, he'll, he'll soon, after this, bring in uh, the past of Israel and their slavery to Egypt. He'll bring in the, the affliction or the oppression of the Assyrians. And he'll point them forward to the coming oppression, which would be in about 200 years after uh, Isaiah, uh, uh, the Lord uh, revealed this to Isaiah, in the Babylonian captivity, when they are taken away uh, in Ceres into Babylon. And then Isaiah points forward to the release after 70 years when Cyrus, uh, the Persian king, sends them back and orders them to rebuild the temple. Isaiah will point even forward uh, into time in the uh, first advent of the Messiah, the servant of the Lord who would come, who would come to bear the sins of his people. He would point them further, even still, to the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ, who would come again and bring that remnant of Israel uh, together and save his people um, in his second coming and the culmination of time. And it begins here, awake, awake. As a kid, I remember my dad, it seemed like, he may tell you differently, but I think it was every Sunday, um, I would hear him wake us up, uh, arise and shine, and give God the glory. And he would do that every Sunday early in the morning, and we would get up and get ready to go to church. Arise and shine and give God the glory. Um, that's Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. The call to wake up comes in the morning. It comes in the morning when the sun has risen, or is soon to be risen, uh, and the light now shines. The day has come. Now wake up. That's the idea here. When, the dark, when in darkness... We sleep, um, but in the light, the living wake up. Um, awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake, awake, clothe yourself in the strength, in your strength, Zion. Clothe yourself in your beautiful, with your beautiful garments, Jerusalem, the holy city. True Israel God's chosen people are called out of the darkness. No merit of their own. No reason for the Lord God to choose Israel among the nations. He did it for his own love, for his people to reveal himself to his people. And through Israel, bless the nations of the world. Is that not a picture of all the elect of God? who the light has shone upon our hearts to wake us up. Um, the command here to wake, awake, is a command that is given, uh, enabled by the Lord God himself. The strength of Israel was bound up in the person and work of the Messiah who would come, fulfilled in him. The, the beautiful garments that Israel was to clothe themselves was not a garment of their own making. It was a garment clothed in the righteousness of the one who would come. True Israel, the chosen people of God, are called, were called out of darkness, 
of the world. We see that in Abraham and into the marvelous light. The redeemed people of God now clothed in the beautiful garments provided by the Lord, no longer to be inhabited by those who are outside the covenant, the uncircumcised, the text characterizes them as the uncircumcised, the unclean, the idolatrous nations that surrounded Israel would no longer come into them. Um, and that would be fulfilled at the culmin culmination of time, um, but it'll be fulfilled in part um, as history progresses. In other words, they have no part they are to have no part with the idolatrous nations around them. We too, grafted into Israel, grafted the church, grafted um, into Christ, uh, have no part in this world. Those who have been awakened, clothed in the righteousness of God. We see here in our text that they are low in the dust. There is a repentance here that is given. They are low in the dust. Shake yourself from the dust, rise up. Shake the dust off and rise up, um, for you are now awakened unto Christ, the Messiah. Paul uses the imagery, uh, the same imagery in Romans chapter 13, uh, uh, verse 11. Do this, knowing the time that is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us uh, lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Ephesians 5, 14. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason, it is said... Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. 1 Thess Thessalonians 5, verse 4 through 6. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day would overtake you like a thief. That's the day of the Lord when, when the culmination of time would come and Christ returns again. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober for those who sleep do their sleeping at night. Those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since you are of the day, let us be sober. You are of the day, so let us be sober. Having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation, for God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the author the light of the world that has come to give light, to shine light in the darkness, light in the darkness uh, of our own heart, light for his people to live in the light until he comes again. We see here the layers of history interwoven and unfolded for Israel. Under God's judgment, Israel would be carried off into Babylon, but they will be delivered again as they were before, time and time again, we see the deliverance of Israel, the deliverance of God's people. Their chains will be released and they will return to the land that was promised to them. For this is what the Lord says, you were sold for nothing and you will be redeemed without money. For this is what the Lord God says, my people went down to Egypt first to reside there. Then the Assyrian oppressed them without reason. And now what do I have here? Declares the Lord, seeing that my people have been taken away uh, without reason. Again, the Lord declares, those who rule over them howl. And my name is continuously reviled all day long. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, on that day, I am the one who is speaking. Here I am. Babylon paid no price for those that they took in slavery. The deportation, the deportation of Israel to Babylon would take place in three, three stages, um, detailed in 2 Kings chapter 24, 2 Kings chapter 25, 
2 Chronicles 36, verse 20. Uh, it's detailed in Jeremiah chapter 52, verses 28 through 30. We see it also in Daniel at the opening, in Daniel chapter 1, verse 3. And for 70 years, Israel would, be, uh, re would remain in captive, would remain in captivity there in Babylon, exactly as what was prophesied by Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 29, 10 through 14. And after the 70 years was over, in the year 5, uh, 539 BC, the Persian king Cyrus the Great uh, would, be re would release the captives in order to return them uh, into, the, into their uh, land, into the promised land. And he would return them at no cost uh, to rebuild the temple, just as what was prophesied by Isaiah some 200 years before um, that event in Isaiah 44, verse 28. All in accordance to God's word so perfectly points to the history that would unfold. How much more Isaiah 53 can be trusted in the person and work of the servant of God who would come to redeem his people. We are, Israel would look forward to the Messiah who would come. We look back. We look back to the cross, the person and work of Christ. But we too look forward to his imminent return to redeem fully his people at the culmination of time when all of his elect are, are, are chosen together and he fulfills ultimately all that he has promised, both to Israel and to us, the church. And keep in mind that this was written 200 years before Israel was even taken into captivity. And though Israel would be taken into captivity, the promise of deliverance was before them. They had that hope of deliverance always in front of them to look to them, look to him, repent, turn, and look to the Messiah to come in faith. And their promised future deliverance was evidenced in the deliverance that had occurred in the past and their experience of the nation of past deliverance. Here, I, I can't help but, uh, as, I, as I read this text, thinking of uh, Dr. Allman and the family camp, I heard his voice. He was one of my favorite professors at DTS. Um, I met him before coming to the chapel, and he would often um, uh, quote his favorite professor with a deep Southern South Carolina accent. I didn't know who he was until I came to the chapel and realized it was Dr. Johnson that he would, he would, uh, he would often quote as his favorite professor. But here I hear the words of Dr. Allman who would repeatedly um, uh, point the students as we come across various texts in scripture with these words, he would say, here it is again. What God has done in the past is a model and a promise to what God will do in the future. Though he's far too creative to do the same things in the same ways. If you know Dr. Allman, you probably have heard him say that. And I wouldn't be surprised if he said that uh, this weekend. And we see that true here in the text, God's wonderful, faithful deliverance of his people in time and time again, in time past. It's pictured in Genesis 3.21, the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden. What did the Lord do? The Lord God made garments uh, of skin for, the, for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. That's the picture of the deliverance of their nakedness, their shame, and their guilt. He provide, he provided the cloth to clothe and cover the shame. And the Lord provides the covering. He provides the deliverance. God will deliver his people. That's something we, we can count on. You can bank on it. If you are his, no matter what trial of life you're going through, the Lord God will deliver his people. The Lord God will deliver you. If you are in him, if you're not in him, there is no deliverance. There is no cloth of, of righteousness to cover uh, your sin and guilt. The plea is to look to him, to awaken and look to the one who delivers his people. God will redeem his people. He has redeemed his people without money, 
Isaiah reminds himself, uh, reminds the people of past deliverance in Egypt. Not only did God redeem Israel from Egypt without money, but the Lord God freed his people and handed over all the treasures of Egypt to his people. So not only were they redeemed without money, but they were given uh, great treasures out of Egypt to them. And time and time again, the Lord would show his people that he is faithful. He would do it again. Isaiah 41, verse 10, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. This is true for Israel, his people. And as the church grafted into the vine, it is true for us as well. What God has done in the past is a model and promise for what God will do in the future. Though he is far too creative to do the same thing in the same ways. We see that in Romans 8, verse 37 through 39. The promise of salvation fully in him. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loves us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. That is the deliverance, and that is where the text points us. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, in that day, I am the one who is speaking. Here I am. And here we see the good news, the gospel laid forth. How beautiful on the mountains of the, are the feet of one who brings good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. Now this is, again, pictured throughout time in layers and ultimately will be fulfilled in the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes, uh, not as the shepherd, but as a reigning king. Um, he reigns. And yet he reigns over sin. He reigns over death in his person and what he has accomplished. And how delightful on the mountains are the feet of one who brings good news. As the captives were released from Babylon and returned into the land, the news would travel. The news would travel. The picture is the redeemed the redemption of God's people. You can see the messengers running at the mountaintops, across the mountains throughout the land, proclaiming the redemption of God's people, proclaiming it from the mountaintops, so to say. And how beautiful are those feet who bring good news. This is the good news that John the Baptist announced as the forerunner of Christ, the Messiah, pointing the people that the Redeemer had come. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world would be John's proclamation uh, uh, from the mountain tops, so to speak. How beautiful are his feet. Uh, Paul uh, takes on this uh, in um, Nahum does as well. Nahum in oh, the Assyrians, the, the, the redemption of God's people against the Assyrians. Nahum would, would write the same thing. Uh, of the good news of those carried on the mountains. Uh, Paul would also in Romans chapter 10, verse 14 through 17, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will, they, how will the heart, um, and, uh, uh, with, how will they believe without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? Just as, it, just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all hear the good news. For Isaiah says, the Lord, uh, uh, Lord, who has believed our report? That's taken from Isaiah 53. So faith comes through hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. 
the good news that is carried forth by the feet of his people. But here we see the, the, the feet of him who brings good news points us really to the work, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ who has brought good news for his people. Isaiah 40 verse 9 says the same thing. Get up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Uh, lift it up and do not fear. Say to the cities of Jerusalem, here is your God. Behold your God. Pointing to the Messiah to come, Lord Jesus Christ. It is perfectly the feet of him who brings good news is perfectly displayed and portrayed in the Messiah himself in the first advent. He is the one who has come as light to the nations. He opened, he opened the eyes of the blind to set the prisoners free. As we've been studying throughout John, throughout, uh, John um, in his earthly ministry, calling his own to himself as the shepherd, bringing good news of the gospel of himself, the very one who has come to take away the sins of the world. Verse 8, listen, your watchmen, raise up their voices. They shout joyfully together, for they will see with their own eyes. And the Lord restores Zion. When the Lord restores Zion, be cheerful, shout joyfully together, you ruins in Jerusalem, of Jerusalem, for the Lord your God comforted his people. Comfort, O oh comfort. He has redeemed Jerusalem. He has purchased them, not without money. He purchased them with the priceless uh, uh, payment of his own blood. The Lord has bared his holy arm. That is the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the holy arm of God, the strong arm of the Lord is the Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of all nations so that at the end of the earth and that the ends of the earth may see the salvation of God. How wonderfully pictured that is of Jesus Christ who has come and who will come again and all the nations will bow. Every knee will and tongue will confess the salvation belongs to the Lord God bound up perfectly in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And as those who have been redeemed, the call here is depart. Verse 11, depart, depart, go out from there. Do not touch what is unclean. Go out of the midst of her. Purify yourselves, you who carry the vessels of the Lord. The same instruction was given. Uh, go and sin no more. Uh, how often did Jesus uh, command after uh, um, the woman of the well, go and sin no more. Verse 12, but you will not go out in a hurry, nor will you go as fugitives. For the Lord will go before you and the Lord God will be your rear guard. Again, the, the writer points Israel back to the deliverance of the past out of Egypt. Exodus chapter 14, verse 13 um, we see the event. Um, Moses says to the people, do not fear, stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. Uh, Israel had been, uh, 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 Pharaoh had, had released the people, sent them with treasures, all the treasures of Egypt. God again hardened Pharaoh's heart uh, he had, I guess, release remorse and went and pursued Israel. And we see here in verse 19, the Lord God who has gone before them and who is their rear guard. The angel of, of, the, the angel of God in Exodus chapter 14, verse 19, the angel of God who had been going before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved before them and stood behind them so that it came between the camp of 
Egypt, and the camp of Israel. And there was the cloud along with the darkness, yet it gave light at night. Thus the one, uh, thus the one did not come near the other all night. The Lord was their rear guard, preserving the people. And the people were commanded to look and watch the deliverance by God's own hand for his people. And so he went before them and split the sea in two. And the people of God walked through on dry land. And he was the rear guard of the people when he swallowed up the armies of Egypt. This is the gospel of good news. Uh, 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 that he is our rear guard. He has gone before us. The angel of God who has gone before the Lord God, the Messiah, has gone before us. And he hems us in as our rear guard. We are fully protected in him. It's a picture of how God protects his people. What he has done in the past, he will do in the future. We are hemmed in in him. The one who has gone before his people to deliver them is the same one who is their rear guard. John 10, verse 27 through 30. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. The picture is here. We are scooped up and held secure in the hand of the son and the hand of the father. We are secure. We see the holy arm of the Lord God, the salvation of his people, the one who redeems Israel, the re one who redeems his people, the strength of Zion, the one who brings good news is the Lord's servant, the deliverer, the Lord who goes before us, the God of Israel as the rear guard of his people is revealed fully in his servant. And how fitting now that these words should come here immediately before Isaiah presents these, the great holy of holies and places us on the mountain peak of prophecy uh, that so beautifully pictures the complete messianic prophecy, prophecy uh, the most complete messianic prophecy in all of the Old Testament. From chapters 52 through uh, verse 13 through 53, verse 12, we enter in what Said has called the holy of holies, the servant lifted up. Behold, my servant will prosper. In other words, he will succeed. The servant will succeed. He will prosper in everything he, he accomplishes. We see that in the life of Jesus Christ and his ministry, his walk on earth, uh, fully man, condescended with wisdom. Everything he did, set forth to do, he accomplished in the first advent. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Ultimately, in the culmination of time, in the second advent, and yet the first advent has come. He will prosper in everything he has set to accomplish. Nothing will thwart the redemptive plan of God. Before the, current, uh, before the servant of the Lord would be exalted with a crown, he would be lifted up and he would bear the cross. Uh, it had to be so. But nothing would thwart his plan. Augustus Top Lady would write of this. The work which his goodness began, the arm of his strength will complete. His promise is yes and amen. And never was forfeited yet. Things future nor things that are now, not, uh, not all things below or above, can make him his purpose forego or sever my soul from his love. My name is written on the palm of his hands. Eternity will not erase. Impressed on his heart, it remains in marks of indelible grace. Yes, I to the end shall endure. As sure as the earnest is given, more happy, but not more secure, are the glorified souls in heaven. They are more happy but they are no more secure than you or, I, you or I who belong to the servant of the Lord God. We are secure in him, just as the saints who have gone before us are secured in him. 
He would be high and lifted up, exalted uh, at the cross. We see the picture of the suffering servant. And that picture here is a, servant, is a picture of his exaltation. He is high and lifted up. He is greatly exalted. And just as many were astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. The author points to this. He says, But we do see him who is made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. He is exalted even in his suffering of his death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. That is, everyone who believes in him without distinction. For it is fitting for him for whom are all things and through whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. The work of the Lord Jesus Christ cannot be thwarted. It will prosper. And for all whom he shed his blood will come, must come, and has no other risk of being lost than to come to him, be brought to him and hear his voice. He would be high and lifted up. Uh, Philip P. Bliss wrote the hymn, Man of Sorrows of Isaiah 53. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high. Hallelujah, what a savior. This points our hearts and our minds to the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the servant lifted up. Just as many were astonished, just as many words were appalled in verse 14, at you, my people, they were appalled and astonished because of their unbelief. And so his appearance was marred beyond that of a man and his form beyond the sons of mankind. And so he will sprinkle many nations. In other words, he will shock They'll startle and leave them speechless. The kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what they had not been told, they will see. And what they had not heard, they will understand. At the culmination of time, when Christ returns, this will be ultimately fulfilled. Paul would take this passage at the end as a picture of his own uh, ministry. We call it Paul's ministry. It was Christ's ministry in and through Paul, he would write, And thus I aspired to preach the gospel, uh, not where Christ was already named, so that I would not build on another man's foundation. But that, as it is written, and he quotes here, They who had no news of him shall see. And they who have not heard shall understand. We are great beneficiaries of this, are we not? As Gentiles uh, who are grafted in, we can't help but re think of Philippians chapter 2. For this reason, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father, by grace, we are able to do that. By his sovereign grace, our hearts have been awakened by the marvelous light who has awakened our heart to exalt him in faith. One day when he returns, we will exalt him. We will bow the knee with joy and thanksgiving, the salvation to come. Yes, we are saved in him, we are secure, we are being saved in him through the sanctification of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. He's given to us as a seal, as a sign of the promise of our, our justification. And when we return to him, either in glory we go to him or he comes to us, that we will be ultimately saved from sin and, and the, the sorrows of this world in our in the fallen world, 
will be redeemed. Awake, awake. By God's grace, we are clothed in his righteousness. If you are not in Christ, you are naked before an all-living God. And the light will shine in the darkness and reveal all things before him. If you are apart from Christ, you will have no covering. You will be utterly exposed in your sin before a righteous and holy God. And his wrath will remain. The call here is the call of Isaiah to look to him, look to the one who would come, who would bear the sins of many upon himself at the cross. He would be buried and he would be risen as a testament to the final amen to the words, it is finished. Salvation is secure. He's ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of God. And he will come again. May God give us grace to look to him, to have joy in him in thanksgiving as we continue in this day, as we look uh, to our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the servant that we are appointed to here this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. How little we scratch the surface um, of the depths of the treasures of the knowledge of him who you have sent uh, by your grace for the love of your people to redeem all and not one will be lost we see in the work of Christ at the cross that his work uh, was perfected it, will, it has succeeded and it is succeeding still this day uh, in your will as your word goes forth. Uh, bless us, Lord. Bless those who are traveling. Be with us as your people. We rest in that promise that you are uh, and you will never forsake us. Uh, and a deliverance will ultimately come. And we look forward to that day in faith and hope and joy. And in thanksgiving, we... We live for you in awe of your work that you have done. We are simple recipients of your magnificent, majestic grace in the person and work of your Son in whom we rest and have joy. May he receive the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.